The Commonwealth has lost a noble son. The city, one of its noblest and most patriotic citizens. To all those who knew him, he, he was a man who we esteemed highly. His home life was beautiful, and he was one of those public spirited Virginia sons. Take it all, Danville has lost her leading and greatest citizen. And it will be long, if ever, before his place can fill. He loved the people of Virginia and served them well. He loved the people of Conwell, all of them. Danville has lost a most remarkable man, a public spirited citizen, our country, a sincere patriot. Major William B. Sutherland was a remarkable man, complex and varied, self-made, practical, respected, proud soldier of the Confederacy, pleased by Lee, yet, at least at first, opposed to leaving the Union. The hard-headed businessman whose entrepreneurial spirit characterized his hometown, Danville, but not the region of his birth, his passion touched all Virginia. It was felt, especially in Danville, because the major life and that of the town were invisible. Early in the 18th century, Colonel William Burr, while establishing the North Carolina Virginia border, explored Lower Pennsylvania County and the area that would become Danville, Virginia. Among other things, the Colonel was taken by the region's soul. He believed it rich enough to go just about everything, and plentifully. It was. But ultimately, one crop emerged as the crop, the cash crop, tobacco. Danville would owe its existence to Bright Leaf and William Sullen his enormous success. Historically, Danville and its environs have been uh, considered by many as a, uh, an area of, uh, of uh, bucolic, uh, lack of growth and that type thing. Uh, Danville was the exception because of the entrepreneurs who had an eye for business, and they saw that Danville had potential, especially with the tobacco products and the manufacture there. With the, with the road system, the barge system, the canal system, uh, and finally the railroad, Danville became uh, a prominent part of Virginia's tobacco heritage and tobacco history. William Sutherland was a young man ready to take on the world. Born near Danville, 1822, the son of a farmer, he was 21 and he took two wagon loads of manufactured tobacco and sold on commission. The transaction fetched $700. It was the first step in a business career that would make him rich and famous, esteemed and influential. Sutherland grew. So Danville. By the 1850s, the town, no longer a mere trading village, had become the third largest tobacco manufacturing center in the state, and Sutherland was its largest manufacturer. Tobacco was his main commercial interest, but hardly the only one. He was also involved in banking, insurance, real estate, and eventually textile manufacturing. Virtually every business Danville had. Public service rounded out his impressive resume. The day that Sullivan arrived in Danville, he became a public figure. He had something about him, a glow, a charisma, that was suited him ideally for business. Having been tutored in a private school up in Franklin County and worked on his dad's farm, he had an eye for the tobacco business. It was there that he made his fortune. It was there, too, that he made his friends. Uh, early on, he became a member of the city alderman. Through his civic deeds, civic works, he uh, became uh, a member of the uh, Roman Eagle Lodge. From age 22 on, he, uh, he was the public figure in Danville. The building behind me at the corner of Lynn and Loyal Streets uh, was built by William T. Sutherland in 1855 as a tobacco factory. And it was in this factory that he utilized steam power for the first time in manufacturing process of tobacco products. He was on the leading edge, the cutting edge of technology of the day with that, of course. And uh, also as a business entrepreneur, he simply succeeded where others uh, were mediocre. He, he thrived. And with that, Dan will thrive. In 1857, 35-year-old William Sutherland was clearly Danville's most important citizen. That year, on what is now Main Street, he built a magnificent house that reflected his status. Set on four acres, purchased from Levi Holbrook, a former New Englander, shared Sutherland's thrift and a love of business. It was a striking Italian built style home. Immediately, it became the area's most recognized residence. Sutherland would live it the rest of his life. Soon, it would be witnessed historic events. As Sutherland's mansion rose, long standing sectional tensions emerged. When Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860, they reached a boil. William T. Sutherland's initial pro-union stand, I think, was based in part of selfishness. This was the case all through the South. Uh, with the exception of the great cotton plants, your well-to-do businessmen were by and large pro-unionists because they didn't want to see the boat rock. They didn't want any economic threat to their own businesses. The war is the worst boat rock of them all. So I think this explains in great part 
Several of the union stand also in South Virginia. Once the session crisis builds up, the solid association. The trouble of business interests, perhaps uh, the urgings of members of the same that many of them died as we in this, had much to do with it. On April 12, 1861, all debate ended. The shelling of Fort Sumter was the opening salvo in four terrible years of civil war. But once Virginia left the union, some of them became a strong secessionist. And you see this on April 25, 1861, only a week after Virginia seceded when Robert E. Lee arrived in Richmond to take command of the Virginia forces. Four members of the secession convention were invited to escort Lee into the capital. William E. Southern was one of them. Once Virginia quit the Union, there was no question Danville would do a chair of the Confederacy. Enthusiastically, the young men joined the colors and marched off. The town they left behind was shared physical destruction that affected so many other cities of the South. Yet Danville actively participated in the conflict, a participation that dramatically altered. Buildings at once or tackle were converted into two hospitals for Confederate wounded. Others became supply depots. Small arms foundry and one of the Confederacy's largest arsenals were built. In the fall of 1863, six vacant tobacco factories were made in prisons for captured Confederate soldiers. Many would die in those prisons most taken by disease. More than 1,300 rest in Danville's National Cemetery. Though it's somewhat isolated in the southern Piedmont section of Virginia, Danville was the western terminus of the Richmond and Danville Railroad. As such, it was the, the outlet for all supplies coming in from the deep south, and these supplies in turn were transferred on the R&D to Richmond itself. In the last couple of months of the Civil War, the Richmond and Danville was the little lifeline for Lee's army. William E. Sullivan is the town's most influential citizen, almost naturally, Became post quartermaster. His health did not permit him to take the field as then. He tried to list in the army, but physically speaking, was not up to it. Uh, as post quartermaster, Danville was sent on to Colonel Robert Robert E. Woodlands, who was commandant of all of Danville's industries or uh, activity during the war. But as post quartermaster, um, Sutherland had a very, very vital role to make sure these flies flowing in from the deep south were transported in turn to Richmond. During the war, um, Sutherland was faced with a two pronged dilemma, one might say. One, he had the uh, conflict responsibility of being post quartermaster. Two, he had the personal responsibility of trying to set his fortune, of trying to save the assets and tobacco and, uh, and banking other enterprises that he had built up. Uh, he had a father to job in the first endeavor that he did in the second. By April 1865, the days of the Confederacy were numbered. The capital, Richmond, could no longer be defended. Trains transported President Jefferson Davis, Moses Cabinet, and key government officials Danville, who David had selected as the South's temporary capital, would be the last one. When Davis, the lead reign, arrived, he met a host of prominent and villains, led by Major Sutherland, recently resigned from the service because of war health. For a week, from the 3rd of April to the 10th of that month, 1865, Confederate cabinet members stayed in various Anvil residences. They conducted the business of a doomed government as best they could. Davis himself chose to live in Major Sutherland's mansion. Ironically, it was that the home of a man who initially spoke against the session, who bought the land, which that home stood for a New Englander with Yankee ideals, became the final White House of the Confederacy. So it was that the last Confederate cabinet meeting was held in that home, and so it was at death there, Jefferson Davis penned his final proclamation to the people of the South. On April 10, 1865, at Appomattox Courthouse, Lee surrendered to Grant. Four bloody years of war were over, so was the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis led Anvil for North Carolina. His fortune made, William Sullivan spent his remaining 28 years devoting himself to family, a wife and daughter, and expanding his longtime interest in agriculture and politics. At the time of his death, he was considered a likely candidate for lieutenant governor of Virginia by the Democratic Party. But whatever he did, service to Danville motivated and fine him. That's why when he died, hundreds of Danvillians came to pay homage. They knew him and how much he gave their town over an extraordinary life. It's been over a century since the man who built this house died in it. Beautiful and historic, it is his legacy to a place he cared deeply about. Because it is man, town, and house, the main now they have always been indivisible.